Anyway, it's so good to have you in worship tonight, and tonight I'm continuing the series of messages that we started um, four weeks ago, um, actually five weeks ago, I guess it was, because I interrupted one weekend um, to just share with you a Christian response to the um, tragic shooting in Orlando, and, uh, but we've been talking about the unseen war, and what we've been talking about pretty much up to this point is the battle that goes on inside of us. In fact, the Bible tells us this, that, you know, that we're warring against the flesh and the devil and the world. That's what the Bible says, that that's where the battle is. So we have been talking for the first four weeks in this series primarily about the battle with the flesh. And we've talked about how that we are shaped in iniquity, we're born in sin, how we are struggling with all of these things because of the sin condition that we are all a part of and tonight we're going to shift our focus a little bit and we're going to start really talking about really some of the ways that Satan attacks us and you know because our battle is with the flesh the devil and the world all right so we'll be talking about all of those things and uh, I just want to really encourage you to be a part of this entire series of messages because what we're discussing is something that I think is so important if we're really going to experience God's power to work in our lives. And um, so I want to invite you to open your Bibles to James chapter 1 and we're going to be looking at that passage in just a few moments. And um, as we do, I know that it's something that, that God wants to use to help all of us to really have a clear understanding of some of the ways Satan attacks us when it comes to really um, these kind of areas in our lives. Now, if you look at the scriptures, you understand pretty quickly that we are dealing with some real challenging situations in our lives. In fact, in Job's book, Job chapter 7 and verse 1, if you remember the story of Job, which we've referred to a variety of times, this is a guy that had all kinds of problems in his life. A guy that had unbelievable physical problems. He had unbelievable financial problems. He had unbelievable, you know, um, family loss problems. I mean, this is a guy that just absolutely understood what tough times were all about. And it was all connected to what? Attacks from who? The devil. Isn't that right? If you know the story, that's where it came from. And when we talk about, you know, um, you know, why is life so tough, we have to understand that those are because those times things are so tough because those are attacks from Satan himself. And this is what he says in Job chapter 7 and verse 1. And is this a question you've ever asked yourself? Okay. Why is life so hard? Let's see any hands. Anybody other than Rick ever asked that question? Why is life so hard? I think it is one of the most common questions that we find ourselves asking. And this is what he says. And then he goes on, why is it so hard and why do we suffer? That's what he says. So I just want to encourage us. Realize what we're talking about tonight is a problem that the human condition has struggled with for now millenniums. How about that? All right. And a millennium is a thousand years. So for millenniums, the human condition has been plagued by why is life so hard? Why is life so tough? And I don't promise to be able to answer all those questions tonight. That would really be um, probably taking on a feat that would require at least more than one sermon. Let's just put it that way, all right? And, um, but I do want to talk about how important it is that we realize that the scriptures talk about this issue over and over again. If you look at James chapter 1 and verse 2, this is what he says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you fall into trials of many kinds. Now, I'll have to tell you, I have flunked the pure joy test more than once. Have you? I mean, I suspect we have. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. 
If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and he'll give, be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed about by the wind. Leave your Bibles open, if you don't mind, to that passage of Scripture, because in a, in a few minutes we'll be referring to it and talking about some of the things that James has to say there. But he's really saying this. He is saying it is so essential for us to realize that we are going to go through those times that Job's talking about. Why is life so hard? Why is life so tough? Why do I suffer? Why do these kinds of things keep happening to me? You know, wouldn't you like for, to just receive a letter from someone? And you know, whenever you receive a letter, I assume that you do what I do. You're expecting the first paragraph or two to be focused on probably something that is more of a greeting and something that is a little more like um, uh, sharing some good news. But James sends a letter. Second sentence in the letter is, Consider pure joy, my friends, when you fall into trials of all kinds. What a wonderful way to just greet you. Isn't that right? And the bottom line boils down to being, he understood that what they were dealing with, the people he's writing this letter to, what they were dealing with needed to be addressed right up front because they're struggling with the same question that Job struggled with. Why is life so incredibly hard? He says this, when you understand that you'll consider joy when you fall into trials of many kinds because you know, and I would circle the words because you know, the testing of your faith will develop perseverance. And um, so let me take a few minutes before we look at James and just identify some of the causes of our tough times. Why and what is it behind the tough times that's really there that causes us to go through these times? Well, I would say this. Life is tough because our rebellion against God broke everything. Now, I've talked a little bit about that in the previous messages, how that Adam and Eve's sin in the garden brought this sin condition on us. But not only did it bring the sin condition on us, but it broke everything. See, here's the thing. Before Adam and Eve sinned by, you know, grabbing that forbidden piece of fruit and eating it, before they did... They lived in a perfect world because if you'll recall, it says this, because of your sin, you will work by the sweat of your brow. We know what that's like in South Florida, all right? Because of your sin, you're going to have weeds that you're going to have to get out of your garden. Isn't that right? Because of your sin, there are going to be thorns and thistles because of that. See, prior to that, no sweat on your brow, Prior to the fall in the garden, no weeds growing in the garden or in your, in your garden because before that we lived in this unbelievable world. And, or we didn't, but they did. And so the key thing to keep in mind, because of Adam and Eve's failure and because of our sin, everything is broken in our world. Everything is. And, um, you know, God gave Adam and Eve this incredible thing um, you know, ability that he gives to us, and that is the ability to choose. Because without choice, there can be no true love. Now, you know, whenever you find the person that you are going to marry, and you make the choice to ask them to become your spouse or to say yes when they ask you, whenever that happens, you understand that that choice means that somewhere along the way, out of all the women or all the men on this planet, this person chose you to be their spouse. And it's important to keep in mind that that is an unbelievable expression of love. You know, the movie The Stepford Wives. I mean, boy, you talk about a perfect wife. But there is no love if there is no choice involved. Is that right? All it is is mechanics is all it boils down to being. 
And that choice is exactly why God gave us the ability to choose. Because God wants me and you to choose to what? Love him. How does James put it? You're going through all of these trials in your life because God knows that when you do, you'll develop perseverance. What is he saying? You'll develop deep devotion to me is what he's communicating. That's what God's looking for in all of our lives. And that's why it's so important for us to understand that these tough times that we go through are times that really go clear back to the choices to rebel against God. And our rebellion has broken everything. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All of us have strayed like sheep. You know, I'm not a shepherd and I've never worked with sheep, but people who do say you don't have to teach them to stray. It just happens by default. We have left God's path to follow our only path, our own path. And I just want to encourage us tonight to realize life is tough because of our rebellion against God. Adam and Eve started this deal, but every one of us has participated. See, the Bible says in Romans 5, 12, sin came into the world because of what man did. And with sin came death. But the reality is, the Bible then says what I shared a few moments ago. All of us have strayed away. All of us have done what Adam and Eve did. And that's important for us to never forget. And you know, the rebellion that was perpetrated by Adam and Eve's decision has been multiplied billions of times in the lives of people. There are three ways that we rebel against God. I thought I'd take a few minutes and highlight these because I'm not sure we understand the distinction. Because the Bible tells us that, um, that the first way we rebel against God is sin. Now, if you look at the word sin... What is the middle letter in the word sin? What is it? I. So whenever you think in terms of sin, it is a what? It is a me problem. Isn't that right? It's an I problem. And that's where it comes from. And that's why it's important to keep in mind. Now, the word sin literally means to fall short. To fall short of the mark or to miss the mark. It's an archery term. And it really comes from pretty much shooting a bow and an arrow. Now, um, I had the opportunity to shoot my very first deer at Sam Mullinax's ranch last September, all right, with a bow, all right. And some of you know that's going to offend you horribly. I'm sorry. He's been very good to eat. How about that, all right? Okay, so... And if you enjoy your McDonald's hamburger, somebody had to kill the cow, by the way, all right? Just to keep that in perspective, okay? And so, that the deer that I shot was about 25 or 30 yards away. And I had sighted my bow in before I went to go hunting. And I knew that it was right on the mark at 30 yards. I knew it was, all right? And so when the deer was like at 25 yards, I knew that the only problem with getting the arrow where it was supposed to be wasn't the bow, it was Rick. How about that, all right? And fortunately, it went where it was supposed to, do, to go and did what it was supposed to do. But what I'm trying to say is if I would have tried to shoot that deer at 70 yards, I would have what? Missed the deer because the arrow would have what? miss the mark. Is that correct? Is that right? That is exactly, exactly what sin does, okay? You aim at whatever you think you're aiming for, and it doesn't get there. That's correct. That's what sin is. It is missing the mark, and it is all because I'm focused on myself and nothing else. Now, there is another word that is used to describe our rebellion against God. It's not just sin. It's called transgression, a transgression is the exact opposite of what I just described as sin. Sin is aiming at something and not getting there, all right? Transgression is looking at it and saying, I don't care what God says, I'm going to do it anyway, all right? 
Now, when Adam and Eve fell into sin in the garden, it was what? A transgression that said, it doesn't matter what God said. I know better than God. Now, so the sin would be I'm aiming and it doesn't hit the mark. A transgression would be like me getting in my car on I-95, the speed limit's 70 miles an hour, and I'm running 120 miles an hour, all right? You know why? Because I look at it and say, this road wasn't designed to run at 70 miles an hour. It was designed to run to 120. Now, I think there are people out there that actually think that. Have you noticed that? I think there are, okay. In particular, those guys on the crotch rockets, okay? And so, that is transgression. If this is the speed limit, 120 is what I decided I'm going to go. Now, whenever the cop pulls you over, you can argue all you want about that road being designed for 120 miles an hour. It's not going to change the fact that you're going to get a big, fat ticket. Is that right? It's what it's going to do. So a transgression is not missing the mark. A transgression is knowing these are the boundaries, and I just decided to go ahead and do it anyway. All right? So that's, that's transgression. Then the Bible uses another word called iniquity. And iniquity means that I intentionally do something that takes advantage of or hurts someone else. That's what it means. Now, we're going to be starting preseason football in what, about three weeks? It is hard to believe when it's so stinking hot. But, you know, that's, that's what's going to happen. About three weeks. Now, let me just use football to illustrate sin, transgression, and iniquity, all right? Sin could be illustrated whenever the football team has driven the opposition down to about the 25 or 30-yard line, and they've done three downs, and they're on the fourth down, and they decide they're going to do what? kick a field goal. Is that right? Now, sin is setting up for the field goal, the kicker hitting the, kicking the ball, and it either missing the uprights or bouncing off of one, okay? He missed the mark. Is that correct? Now, then transgression would be illustrated by a lineman that is intentionally crossing the line before the ball is snapped. Is that correct? That would be what? That would be a transgression. Because what they've done wasn't miss the mark. They tried to play to the edge of the rule, and it didn't work. Correct? So that's transgression. Iniquity is whenever somebody goes after the quarterback knock him down, and kick him in the head, which does happen. That'd be iniquity. Is that right? Because it was an intentional attempt to damage. Why do we have so much trouble in our world? Because of sin, because of transgression, because of iniquity. Is that correct? That's the thing to keep in mind. That's why there's so much trouble in the world. We've got to understand it. Because so many times, look at it and say, why is life so tough? So the very first answer to why life is so tough is what? Because of sin, because of transgression, because of iniquity. You say, well, I don't kick people in the head. If you've ever slandered somebody, you have what? Kicked them in the head. Is that right? If you've ever taken advantage of someone, that would be what I would call a transgression and you have deliberately crossed the line. If you aimed at something but fell short of the mark, that is sin. And all of those things are why life is so tough. Let me move on and focus on four facts that James identifies about tough times. First of all, he makes it really clear that tough times are inevitable. He said, just consider joy, my brothers, consider pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. But he is making it clear, 
if you think you're getting through this life, if you think you're getting through the spiritual journey without tough times, you're going to be disillusioned very, very quickly. So stop and understand that tough times are inevitable. It doesn't matter. There's no exceptions to it. You know, the best people on the planet frequently have the toughest times. I always felt like that my little mom, who is one of the most wonderful people to ever walk on this planet, lived one of the toughest lives. You know, she was widowed, she was 37. She got Parkinson's in her 60s that robbed her of much of her mobility. She then developed pancreatic cancer and died 10 and a half months later. And I looked at it and said, you know what? It just doesn't make any sense. And you can't make sense out of that stuff, looking at life from this direction. And we talked a few weeks ago. You can't make sense out of any of this stuff looking at it horizontally. The only way you make sense out of this is looking at it vertically. That's the only way. And I just want to encourage us today. Understand, it doesn't matter how wonderful of a person you are. It doesn't matter how God-fearing you are. It doesn't matter how devoted and dedicated you are. God's best saints always go through tough places. I was at this conference last week with Rick Warren out in California. And this is what he said. He said, if you want to be used greatly by God, then expect to be hurt greatly by life and ministry. And he's exactly right. He's exactly right. God's choice servants seemingly have always suffered the most. Always have. You say, that doesn't make sense. Well, it doesn't make sense here, but it makes sense here. That's what we've got to keep in perspective. And that's the key thing for us to not ever forget. You know, tough times, James tells us, is unpredictable. He says, when you face problems, literally, you could translate it better when you fall into problems unexpectedly. You know, so the reality is this, that we all have those things. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan? It says he fell among thieves. Well, I don't think he saw a bunch of thieves. He said, let me find a rock and trip right in the middle of you, okay? You know, what it meant was, what it simply meant was exactly what I said. And that is this. And that is that unexpectedly he encountered thieves who beat him and robbed him and left him for dead. That's what it meant. Unexpectedly. And that's exactly what James is saying here. When you face the unexpected problems in life. So tough times are inevitable. Tough times are unpredictable. And then tough times come in all sizes and all shapes. You know, it's not one size fits all. There's one thing about problems I've discovered. You seldom deal with boredom. Because such a wide variety of them in life. Kind of reminds me of the guy that was a bricklayer. And he had a pretty severe accident repairing the damage from a hurricane and so when he was writing his report out this is what he said and I'm just going to read it to you when I got to the building I found the hurricane had knocked off some bricks around the top so I rigged up a beam with a pulley at the top of the building hoisted a couple of barrels full of bricks when I'd fixed the damage area there were a lot of bricks left over then I went to the bottom and began releasing the line Unfortunately, the barrel of bricks was much heavier than I was. And before I knew what was happening, the barrel started coming down, jerking me up. I decided to hang on, since I was too far off the ground by then to jump. And halfway up, I met the barrel of bricks coming down fast. I received a hard blow to my shoulder. And then I continued to the top, banging my head against the beam and getting my fingers pinched and jammed in the pulley. When the barrel hit the ground hard, the bottom burst out of it, allowing the bricks to spill out. It was now that I was heavier than the bar barrel. So I started down at high speed. Halfway down, I met the barrel coming up. 
and received severe injuries to my shins. When I hit the ground, I landed on the pile of spilled bricks, <laughs> getting several painful cuts and deep bruises. At this point, I must have lost my presence of mind because I let go of the rope. The barrel came down quite fast, giving me another blow to my head and putting me in the hospital. I just request sick leave. Well, I don't know if you've had that kind of a day, but I've had some experiences that feel just about that bizarre, I can tell you. The reality is that problems come in all sizes, all shades, all shapes, all kinds of circumstances. Some are inconveniences, and some of them are thorns in the flesh that we carry, as Paul did, for virtually a lifetime. So I just would encourage us to understand that when we deal with that, here's the struggle we have, and that is this. It creates all of these internal, unseen battles going on inside of us. We ask the why question. We ask the why me question. We ask the why now question. We ask every kind of question we can come up with. You say, Rick, how do you know that? Because I ask those questions too. All of us ask them. Every single one of them. And it's an unseen war that goes on. It's an unseen battle in our lives. Once in a while, we'll let somebody have a glimmer into our soul. Once in a while, we'll let them see just a little bit of the pain and the heartbreak we're dealing with. And sometimes there's someone sensitive enough in our lives that they actually will push beyond the facade that we put up. You know, where we say to people, how are you doing? And what's our general response? We're such liars. Such liars. What is it? Fine. Fine. Okay. Great. Liar, 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 liar. Now, I'm not telling you to tell everybody you meet that I'm having one of those days where the barrel's falling on my head and I'm pitching my fingers in the pulley, all right? I'm not trying to communicate that. All I'm just saying is this, that it creates this unseen battle that creates despondency and discouragement and defeat in our lives. We will never win the unseen war until we understand this is a part of the unseen war in our lives. And why am I dedicating all this time on it? Because I will tell you, I believe with all my heart that we all struggle with these issues that we've been talking about. Every single one of us does. And it's important to keep in mind that God wants us not to struggle. He wants us to overcome. And that's why I've subtitled this series, Living Victoriously in a Broken World. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. It will never happen until we understand that we're fighting an unseen war. Then I would say that James tells us that tough times have purpose. Look at verses 3 and 4. You know, he says that God will use tough times to purify our faith. Look at verse 3. The testing of your faith. He uses the word testing as in silver and gold. Now, I've never had gold nor silver in abundance in my life, that's for sure. But people who do that do say that when you put gold in a pot and you liquefy it, you know what happens? All the non-gold material floats to the surface and they skim it off. That is exactly what he's saying. That the impurities in my life, because of the tough times I'm going through, God uses them to purify my faith. Why does God want me to have a purified faith? Well, let me put it this way. It's because God wants me to have a devotion to him that is not 90%, not 95%, not 99%. God wants my devotion to him to be what? 100%. And the only way that he can bring me to a point of having that level of devotion is to go through these kind of tough times <coughs> Excuse me, that we're talking about and understand that God is using them in special ways. Now, and then God will use tough times, and this is one that drives me nuts, to fortify our patience. <coughs> James 3, you say, Rick, what do you mean by that? Because I am tired of this patience test in my life. I really am. Because I still, no matter how many tough times I go through, 
still detest waiting at red lights. I detest waiting in line. You say, Rick, that's bad. Well, maybe you just like waiting in long lines. I don't enjoy it at all. All right? So what's he do? The testing of your faith develops perseverance. Now, I like what it really means, okay? I really do. Because he's not talking about passive patience. He's talking about staying power. He's talking about endurance. And I do think that God's given me some of that. I wouldn't have been here 23 plus years if that wasn't the case, all right? But the bottom line is this. God is using that to give us the ability to do what? Keep on keeping on. To keep on moving forward. To keep on advancing. But he uses all these things that frustrate us to teach us that. And then God will use tough times to mature our character. Look at verses 3 and 4. The testing of your faith produces perseverance that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything, is what James says. So God's ultimate purpose in our lives is to produce spiritual maturity. That's what God wants from me. That's what he wants from you. Why does God want us to be spiritually mature? Because the only way that we will ever be able to reproduce ourselves spiritually is to be mature. Because, you know, we say that a child has grown to maturity when it, what, is able to reproduce. And so that's one of the things. We also understand that immaturity causes us to do many reckless, foolish things and sometimes crazy kinds of things. And God wants us to not be characterized by recklessness and foolishness. So he wants us to grow up to be mature men and mature women that he can work through our lives to accomplish his amazing purposes. So I would say if that's going to happen, we have to let God use tough times to accomplish his purposes. How does God use these times? Well, I think it's key to keep in mind that God uses tough times to direct our lives. Proverbs 20, verse 30 says, sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways. Um, Once in a while, I think God just has to light a fire under us to get us moving. And that's why we go through tough times. And then God uses tough times to inspect our lives. James 1, 2, and 3, when you have many kinds of troubles, you shall be given... You should be full of joy because you know that those troubles test your faith and will give you patience. As I said a few moments ago, whenever we get in the fire, that's whenever the impurities come out of our life. Someone said that Christians are like tea bags, that you don't know what's inside of them until you drop them into hot water. And that's what really does reveal what's inside of us. And then God uses tough times to correct our lives. Psalm 119, 71 and 72. My troubles turned out all for the best. They forced me to learn from your textbook. Truth from your mouth means more to me than striking it rich in a gold mine. There are just some lessons that God can only teach us through pain and through failure in our lives. Those things are critically important. And you know, I don't know what your experiences with hot stoves has been, but a lot of kids, you can tell them, Don't touch that stove because it's hot. And what do they do? Touch the stove. Is that correct? Well, there's been a whole bunch of times that God said, Hey, Rick, don't touch that. Like some little snotty-nosed brat. Guess what I do? I touch it. It's what I do. And see, God says the only way that we learn some things is through pain and through failure. And then God uses tough times to protect our lives. Genesis 50, verse 20, um, Joseph is talking to his brothers about them selling them as a slave. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. You know, sometimes the biggest, what looks like the biggest problem in our lives turns out to be the greatest blessing in our lives. And, <clears throat> and I, um, I just think that uh, many times, Because we're so focused in this direction, we don't understand that. Heard about a guy that was fired because he would not do something dishonest for his employer. And he was just heartbroken over losing his job. And obviously, because he was standing for right instead of wrong, he felt there was a huge injustice. 
until about a year and a half later, all of the leaders of that company were arrested for the very thing he refused to do, and many of them went to prison. Then all of a sudden he realized that what was the worst thing he thought could happen in his life was actually a great blessing in disguise. And I think we've got to stop and look at it from that vantage point. Sometimes what we think is the worst thing that could happen is not frequently the worst thing that could happen. It's actually God redirecting our lives because of what's going on. So let me just encourage us to keep that in mind. And so Joseph understood that his slavery, his betrayal by his brothers, his slavery, the false accusation, his imprisonment, ultimately was things that God was using. That looking at it, you'd say those are really tough times. But ultimately, God was using it to his advantage. And then God uses tough times to perfect our lives. Romans 5, 3, and 4. There's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when we're hemmed in with troubles because we know how troubles can develop patient, passionate patience in us and how that patience in turn forges the tempered still of virtue keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. So whenever we deal with tough times correctly, that's when God is shaping and building and reshaping our character. See, I've discovered that God's more interested in who I am than he is in my comfort. Now that's a tough thing to come to an understanding of because many, many times we look at it and say, God, I am so miserable with this. I don't know why you don't do something about it. And we've got to stop and understand that God is more interested in making us the men and women character-wise he wants us to be than anything to do with our comfort or our pleasure. So to benefit from tough times, then respond to them God's way. How do you do that? Focus on the positive and not on the negative. James 1, 2, consider pure joy when you face trials. Now, He's not saying fake it, put on a plastic smile, pretend that you're in Pollyanna's little town. God never asks us to deny reality. He doesn't encourage us to develop some sadistic, you know, joy in pain, you know, where we're saying, good, I get a chance to suffer. You know, that's ridiculous. He's not wanting us to develop a martyr complex. He doesn't want us to rejoice because we have a problem. He wants us to rejoice in spite of the problem. That's the key thing to be aware of. You know, we don't thank God for the situation. We thank God in the situation. So there's a world of difference between those two perspectives. And 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning you in Christ Jesus. I don't have to thank God for everything. I can just thank God in the middle of everything. Problems don't automatically produce blessings. For some people, problems absolutely destroy them because they don't respond to them the right way. You know, someone put it this way, problems will either make you bitter or they'll make you better. And there's only a one letter difference between those two words. And what letter is that? I and E, isn't that right? So how I respond to those problems will determine whether I get better or whether I get bitter. And you hang around somebody that's allowed their tough times to make them bitter, and that's not a pleasant thing to do. You know, from strange and unusual events in the Encyclopedia Britannica, your book, there's a guy named Brian Heiss. I'd say he had more than his share of bad luck in a hot summer July. This is what he said. His apartment in Provo, Utah became flooded from a broken pipe in the upstairs apartment. The manager told him to go out and rent a water vacuum. That's when he discovered his car had a flat tire. He changed it, went inside again and called a friend for help. From the electric shock he got from the phone, he inadvertently ripped the phone from the wall. Before he could leave the apartment a second time, a neighbor had to kick the door down because the damage had jammed it shut. While all this was going on, someone stole Heiss's car. But it was almost out of gas, so he found it a few blocks away, but had to push it to a gas station where he filled up the tank. That evening, he attended a military ceremony at his university. 
He injured himself pretty severely when he sat, somehow sat on a bayonet which had been tossed in the front seat. The doctor was able to stitch up the wound, but no one was able to resuscitate four of Heiss's canaries who were crushed to death from falling plaster in his apartment. After Heiss slipped on a wet carpet and badly injured his tailbone, he began to wonder if God wanted him dead but kept missing. <laughs> and I'd have to agree. After that kind of day, I'd feel like God was wanting me dead but kept missing. So the key thing for us to keep in mind, focus on the positive and not on the negative. Second, pray instead of complaining. James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and he will be given to him. So pray for wisdom and God see, help God to see this as an opportunity to grow. And, um, you know, there's no situation that I cannot benefit from if I ask the right question. And the right question is not why. Ask what. What are you wanting to do in my life? And how can I then do what you want me to do? And then trust God to see you through. Because God knows what's best for our lives. And God is in the business of making us the people that he created us to be. And then let the tough time shift your focus to the resurrection of Jesus. Um, I don't think that anybody ever went through a tougher time than Jesus Christ did. And, <coughs> you know, I've dealt with quite a bit of stress in my life over the years. Um, but I can tell you that to this point, I've never been under so much stress. I sweated drops of blood. And that's what Jesus experienced. I've been betrayed I have been abandoned by people I thought I could trust. But I've not had everybody I worked with abandon me and prove untrustworthy. You see what I'm saying? But he did. So the resurrection assures us of some things that I think we need to focus on if we're going to be able to respond to life tough, life's tough times the way God wants us to. The resurrection assures us there's no problem too big for Jesus to fix. There's not a problem in your life, not a tough place that's too big for Jesus to fix. Not a single one. The resurrection assures us there's no despair so deep that we cannot hope again. You know, on that, what we call Good Friday, the disciples were in absolute total despair and despondency. That was because, as I shared a few weeks ago, it was Friday, but Sunday was coming. The resurrection assures us there's no sin stain so black, but what Jesus can cleanse it. And the resurrection assures us that no man is going too far away for Jesus to bring him back. That's the key thing for us to keep in perspective. So when you're in a dark, tough, difficult place in your life if you don't know Jesus as your Savior the starting point is accept him as your Savior John 16 33 says Jesus says in this world you will not that you might or could but that you will have trouble but take heart I have overcome the world and the only way that you and I are going to be able to win the unseen war is to know that we have a personal relationship with Jesus I've shared with you multiple times that for you know from the time I was just a little guy on I had a good clear understanding of what Jesus came in this world to do but it wasn't until seven, uh, 17 years old that I personally believed it see you don't win the unseen war knowing that Jesus is the savior of the world you don't win the unseen world knowing that he died for your sins you win the unseen war when he takes control of your life. Then you have him, as I've shared with you several times in this series, living within you. And when he lives within you, you have his presence, you have his power, you have his strength, you have his assistance with you wherever you're at. So accept him as your savior if you don't know him personally. And then, if you're going through a tough time, just follow his light. Follow his light one step at a time. When I was in high school, we went on a, uh, our high school senior trip, 
and we went to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. Now, if you've been there, you know that it's a massive tech cave. It's called Mammoth Cave for a reason. And we got down into the heart of the biggest areas of that cave. At least I hope it was the biggest areas. And when we got there, they turned all the lights off. Now, that's a blackness that is like nothing I've ever experienced in my entire life. Because always somewhere you've got an LED light on or something in the distance, a star or something. That was pure, total blackness is what it was. No light anywhere. And you know, our guide then just had a small flashlight with him. And he began making his way out of that cave. And I'll tell you what I had my eyes on, on the light. Because I knew the only way out of there was what? Following the light. And some of us are going through some really dark, tough places in our lives right now. We are. We don't know where to turn because everything seems so overwhelmingly dark, so unbelievably difficult. We don't know which way to turn. And we're so blinded by the darkness of the tough places we're going through. Let me just encourage you. Look for the light. Look for the light because the light will lead you out of the darkness. Jesus says what? I am the what? Light of the world. And that's what he wants us to keep our focuses, focus on is the fact he's the light of the world. When we do, it changes our whole perspective on what we're dealing with. And I know that some of us are going through some really, really tough, tough places in our lives. And I'm not going to ask you to come forward. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get that Band-Aid out that you were given. Please get it out. And I want you then to either write on your hand or I want you to write on the inside of the the Band-Aid. Just go ahead and open it up. How about that? I would suggest you just write on your hand one tough, maybe the toughest spot you're going through. Just write it down in one word. Okay? It may be marriage. It may be kids. It may be money. It may be health. You see what I'm saying? Just write it down. Write it on your hand. And then when you do, once you do that, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put the Band-Aid over it. Now, if you see me with a Band-Aid on my hand, what are you going to say? What did you do? Is that right? Now, not everybody would ask you that question, and I'd encourage you to keep it on, at least until you get your next shower. <coughs> and I hope for some of us that's not too long. Yeah. <laughs> but put it on, leave it on. Just write it, cover it up with a Band-Aid. And if the right person asks you, what's that all about? You can say, well, Rick had us do that if you want to. But if the right person asks you, what's that all about? Say, so you know what? I've got a tough place I'm going through. Maybe you could pray with me about that. Does that make sense? Just put that Band-Aid on. Leave it on for a little while. You know, you probably have some more at home. Wear one all week. Just don't wait all week to take your bath. How about that? All right? And I want to pray for all of us now that God will help us, really, to experience his power. God, you know what we're dealing with in all of our lives. You know, the tough places we go through. You know, the heartbreaking circumstances. You know, the needs that we have that just seemingly don't go away. The problems that sometimes not only don't go away, they get worse. And God, there's some of those areas in my life right now that, that are so, so tough that there are just times I don't even know what to say about it. And I know that for most of us in this room, if not all of us, there's something like that going on in our lives. And I just pray at this very instant that your Holy Spirit would just speak peace to all of us. For those who don't know you as their Savior, may they move from a mental understanding of who you are to a personal, life-changing relationship with you and allow you to take control of their lives. Then, God, for those of us who just feel like we are in the darkest, darkest place we can be in, may we then look for your light and follow your light out of the tunnel or the cave of darkness that we're in. May we experience hope tonight. May we experience victory tonight. 
God, this is an unseen war that we're dealing with, and it affects us in ways that most of the time we don't know how to talk to someone about it. And most of the time we're not sure there's anybody we can trust to talk to about it. So I just pray that your Holy Spirit would work in an unbelievable way in each of our lives and help us, God, to be acutely aware that you have powerful things you're going to do in our lives tonight. And we just thank you for all that you'll do in the days to come. And we ask this in your powerful name. Amen.